one specific example of how, how animals go about achieving a steady state internally is going to be thermal regulation. Thermal deals with uh, temperature. So the first part of the word, thermal deals with uh, temperature and then regulation refers to those animals that have mechanisms uh, internally to be able to maintain conditions that are going to be sometimes different from what the external environment is going to be doing. And so with regards to thermal regulation, there are going to be two types of animals we can consider. There are going to be those that are endothermic and those that are going to be ectothermic. To really distinguish between endothermy and ectothermy, what one has to think about is the answer to the question, what is the main source for regulating temperature? So when we look at the word endothermic, endo means inside and thermic means, again, you know, heat, in this case, uh, as it applies to temperature. And so endothermic is when an animal has internal strategies, organs, or mechanisms for generating heat, and the generating of heat is going to be what helps them maintain a steady temperature, sometimes even when the environment is changing. Ectothermic animals are going to be those that are using an external source. Ecto, outside. Thermic, again, it's making reference to temperature, but in this case, heat, the source of heat that allows them to maintain a steady state in, with regards to temperature. And so when you look at the animal kingdom, you're going to find that most animals are going to be ectothermic. At this point, I want to caution you to avoid using terms you might have used uh, in the past, like uh, cold-blooded and warm-blooded. The problem with those uh, terms is that animals you call cold-blooded, for example, uh, you, one can think of a snake, uh, there are going to be times in the day when they may be basking in the sun and their body temperature can actually be even hotter and the temperature of the blood even hotter than the blood we have in an endothermic animal, such as uh, a mammal. So we really, in science, don't want to use those terms, cold-blooded or warm-blooded, because they are not uh, very effective at describing exactly what an animal is doing to generate heat uh, from inside or to take heat from the outside. So remember, the question here uh, is to think about what is the source of heat? And if you're trying to answer the question, what is the source of heat in relationship to animals, then we have two terms, endothermic, those with internal sources of heat, and ectothermic, those rely on external sources of heat. So the majority of animals, I was saying, are going to be ectothermic. So most uh, fish, all of the invertebrates we've seen in class, uh, the majority of them, I should say, and non-avian reptiles. Avian here means birds. So uh, reptiles that are not birds are going to be also, for the most part, ectothermic. And so that leaves the question, well, so what are the endotherms? And the endotherms are going to be, by tradition, uh, mammals, birds, uh, there are going to be a few exceptions. There are some kinds of fish that can uh, be uh, uh, display some endothermy. There are going to be also some insects that are capable of displaying endothermy. If the environment is too cold, uh, they can use muscle contractions and metabolic activity to increase the uh, release of heat that is going to keep them uh, at a warmer temperature compared compared to the surrounding environment. Uh, and so. Another concept that we want to consider when we're talking about uh, achieving a steady state internally with regards to uh, temperature is the idea of should an animal invest a lot of energy to maintain a steady temperature all the time, like we saw the case of the river otters where when the water was cold, their body temperature was around 38 degrees. When the water was warmer, at like 40 degrees, their body temperature was still 38. And so this requires a, a expenditure of energy. It requires more effort. Uh, so what should animals do if the external environment 
is changing with regards to temperature. And so that is what uh, we can answer in terms of uh, these words we see here, like a poikilotherms or homeotherms. So a poikilotherm is going to be an animal that allows its body temperature to change according to the environment. Another word we can use is conform. When an animal allows its own body temperature to conform to the environment, meaning doing exactly the same thing as what the environment is doing, is going to be a poikilotherm. Now, again, I want to make sure that you don't make the mistake of thinking, well, uh, poikilotherms are going to be those that are uh, ectothermic, because that is not the case. We may find endotherms, like some mammals, uh, like a naked mole rat, those are going to maintain a temperature in the body that is going to sometimes fluctuate if the dirt or the tunnels where they live underground gets cooler, their body temperature can also drop. So even though they are generating some heat to prevent from getting too cold, they can allow their body temperature to drop when the tunnels get cold. If the tunnels, because a naked mole rat is an animal that lives underground in tunnels, if those tunnels get too hot, they can also allow the body temperature to increase according to that heat. And so you see an animal can be both. An animal can be an endotherm and a poikilotherm. It's two different questions. Endotherm, what's the source of heat? Oh, it's from inside. Poikilotherm, what's the question? Does the animal allow its body temperature to fluctuate? And if the answer is yes, then you are right in calling it a poikilotherm. So animals are going to be uh, sometimes uh, obtaining a temperature, I'm sorry, obtaining heat from external sources and exchanging uh, heat with the surrounding environment. In this example you see here, you can take a, get an idea for what are the different types of exchanges. Radiation, uh, the best example we have is the energy in the form of heat that comes from the sun and animals can absorb through the skin. At the same time, an animal can get heat from radiation. Their own body, their own skin is going to be releasing small amounts of heat, of heat uh, through radiation. Evaporation has to do with heat that is released in the form of water vapor. And so we've learned from Bio211 that the hydrogen bonds of water can absorb and retain large amounts of heat. If more heat is absorbed by the hydrogen bonds of water, those bonds can break that makes water evaporate, carrying with it the excessive heat an animal may have had. So evaporation deals with heat that is going to be lost when water evaporates from the animal body. Conduction is a different type of exchange. In conduction, uh, an animal may be absorbing heat directly by contact with uh, another uh, surface in the environment. In this case, a lizard can absorb some radiation from, um, I'm sorry, can absorb some heat from a hot rock uh, in the summer. Sometimes animals may also uh, be uh, losing some heat, transferring heat, if there's the rock where the animal is sitting is going to be cooler. And uh, convection, uh, this is going to be heat that is lost when two things are moving over the surface of the animal. One thing can be air, and the other one can be water. So when water or air move over the surface of the animal and carries away heat, that is going to be heat loss by convection. So those are, those are going to be uh, different ways in which animals can exchange heat. And we can, we can see, like in the case of a uh, poikilotherm, uh, obtaining heat from the environment or releasing it will depend on whether or not they want to keep an internal steady state. Poikilotherms, I said, are the ones that conform. Poikilotherms are the ones that allow their temperature to drop in a cold environment. Poikilotherms allow their body temperature to go up in a warm environment. Uh, regulators <clears throat> are going to be homeotherms. And um, I'm doing a, a yes. So the, the homeotherm is going to be one that allows uh, internal mechanisms to generate heat when it's necessary so that 
the temperature can be steady or use as internal mechanisms to release, ex release excess heat, again, to allow for its internal temperature to be uh, steady. So homeotherms, they are going to be performing some form of regulation. As I mentioned before, the otter, the river otter, in a previous example in a different video, would be an example of a homeotherm because its temperature uh, stays the same. The question somebody can ask me, what about an ectotherm? And again, think about ectotherm means animal using sources of heat from the outside. Can an ectotherm be a homeotherm? And the answer is yes. There are some animals like fish that live so deep in the ocean where temperatures never change. They are year round about the same. A fish or an invertebrate living in such water uh, type of an environment is going to be an ectotherm because they're re relying on external sources of heat, but their own body temperature is not going to change because the environment, uh, environmental temperature doesn't change. All right, so you have two sets of concepts to deal with, endothermy versus ectothermy and uh, poikilothermy versus homeothermy. And uh, we can discuss further in class if you have the need to provide more examples and uh, further understand what these two sets of words uh, represent. In terms of thermal regulation, what can an animal do? So animals that don't want to lose excessive amounts of heat out through the bodies are going to rely on strategies like insulation. Insulation can be the skin of an animal, as I mentioned before in class, sometimes underneath the dermal layers of the skin, there is going to be like layers of fat. And so fat is going to be an important insulator. For animals like this walrus you see right here, uh, fat, trying to get my laser pointer to function, yes. So for this animal, like a walrus, uh, the layer of insulation, fat, uh, is so thick that it receives another name. It's called blubber. And so for, for this animal, blubber is important because remember there is going to be a lot of heat that will be lost by convection when water moves over the surface of the animal when the animal is in water. So they don't want to lose excessive amounts of heat. The blubber will help uh, in a way retain, uh, keep uh, excessive heat from going out to the surface of the skin. Uh, what about birds, uh, feathers? There are different kinds of feathers. Uh, feathers are going to be sometimes for flight, but especially on the chest of a bird, they're going to be downy feathers. And you're familiar with uh, pillows that uh, you can purchase like down pillows, or also the jackets we use that have down filling to keep us warm. Well, those came from birds. And I have this illustration here so you can see the structure of a feather. Feathers are going to have barbs in barbules and there's going to be spaces that are occupied by air between the barbs and the barbules, and that air that is trapped there in between those spaces is going to be the one that provides uh, the insulation. So insulation is a strategy for helping achieve a steady state in, with regards to temperature. Uh, some animals are going to have circulatory adaptations, and so blood carries heat. And so imagine on an animal like this one where blood coming from uh, the middle part of the animal, from the core of the animal, circulates down into the legs, one can expect that there's going to be a certain amount of heat that is going to be lost as blood moves into the legs. Then what can the animal do to prevent losing so much of that heat carried by blood moving down into the legs? Here's what uh, animals like birds can do. Uh, and by the way, the flippers of uh, dolphins and uh, other limbs used by aquatic animals that are in cold uh, waters can do the same thing. Arteries are going to be, by definition, the vessels that are carrying blood away from the heart. An artery coming from the heart is going to have blood with a precious amount of heat that the animal doesn't want to lose. And so notice that the vein, which is returning back to the heart, that's our definition of a vein, is a large vessel that is returning blood back to the heart, is going to be coming back from the lower part of the leg or the foot where some heat has been lost. Look at the direction of the flow. The artery is moving blood in a direction that is opposite to the vein. 
Furthermore, the position of the two is so close to one another that heat in the blood moving down through the artery, a lot of that heat is going to be moving out of the artery, but it's going to go here to the blood that is returning back to the heart in the vein. Down here, the blood down here has lost a significant amount of heat. But the moment this blood begins to move back, it's picking up some of the heat that is being transferred from the artery. And so the vein is going to be collecting that heat and sending it back into the core of the animal. The same strategy, the same mechanism works with like the flipper of a dolphin. And so we call this type of a strategy a countercurrent heat exchange. Look at these three words here countercurrent heat exchange. Counter means opposite. What's opposite? Or oh, the direction of blood flow. High uh, heat content uh, blood coming down from the artery is going to be transferring heat over to the vein, which has a lower heat content. And so by the two of them moving in opposite directions, it can help the animal prevent some of this heat from reaching down here, the bottom of the leg or the foot, where precious heat would be lost. So before it gets lost down here, it's like the heat is being transferred over to the vein. So that's what this set of words here means. Counter current heat exchange means that the blood in arteries and the blood from veins are traveling in opposite directions in real close proximity uh, with one another. Another circulatory uh, adaptation for uh, removing excess heat or for keeping inside precious heat the animal done, doesn't want to lose is going to be the concepts of vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Vaso means vessel, like blood vessels, and so dilation means that they're going to be expanding. When an animal wants to get rid of excess heat, uh, signals coming from the brain to vessels like capillaries especially will lead to expanding. Um, smooth muscle contractions will allow for that expansion. The diameter of the capillaries will increase. More blood will flow. And so if that blood is flowing near the surface of the skin, heat can be released to the outside by convection. Uh, maybe also some radiation. Uh, then what about vasoconstriction? In the case of vasoconstriction, the idea is going to be that vessels now, again, obeying signals coming from the brain, they're going to reduce the diameter. And so the vessels are going to be constricted, again, by the action of smooth muscle cells. And so this vasoconstriction is going to lower the amount of blood flowing near the surface of the skin. And in contrast to a person who's feeling hot and the skin looks red, a person who is cold, they will look pale. And so that pale appearance is because there's going to be less blood coming to the surface of the skin of arms, hands, legs, feet, and of course the neck and the face as well. So these are circulatory adaptations for, as I said before, uh, thermal regulation. Another strategy that animals can use for uh, exchanging heat, uh, and in this case it's going to be for getting rid of excess heat, is going to be evaporative cooling. And there are going to be different strategies for inducing water in the body to take excess heat and then by the process of evaporation, carrying it away. Uh, we are familiar with sweat. We've talked about this on a couple of occasions already. But what about other strategies for losing excessive heat by evaporative cooling? One is going to be wallowing. And wallowing is exactly what many animals do in hot, very hot environments. Here you see this rhino and it's found a pool of water, and for the most part, it looks very muddy, very dirty. These animals, they don't mind that. And so when the skin of the animal gets wet, now you have the hydrogen bonds of water collecting excessive heat, that water evaporates, and it creates the same effect of cooling that our own sweat would do for our bodies. So wallowing means rolling in water or mud, and then when that water evaporates, providing the cooling sensation. Another one is going to be panting. So some animals are going to be getting rid of excess heat by the process of panting. You know, dogs don't sweat. When a dog is overheated, they will be, <laughs> they stick their tongue out, they breathe heavily in and out. And whenever they exhale, there's going to be water vapor coming out and that water vapor is carrying away excess heat. 
a burst zone sweat, and you can see one here that is overheated. And I can tell that not just because the beak is open, but also because the wings are extended, and that increases the amount of surface for uh, either heat to be lost by radiation or by convection, uh, either one of those two mechanisms. So there you have evaporative cooling, behavioral responses, can also be useful for an animal. Here you see a dragonfly that has positioned its wings and its body to minimize the amount of heat radiating from the sun. So the wings are pointed in the direction of the sun and the body is also facing that way, uh, minimizing the surface exposed to the sun rays. Other behavioral responses animals can do, if it's too hot outside, burrow, go underground, because just a couple of inches underground can be up to 10 degrees cooler than the surface can be. Burrowing is also effective for avoiding cold temperatures. If the outside is too cold, go underground. Soil is a good insulator because the space between soil particles uh, that traps air, and so it becomes an insulator as well. Huddling. Huddling is going to be when animals get close to one another and uh, by staying in close proximity, they can retain more heat by uh, basically benefiting. Heat that is being released by the one animal can be uh, absorbed, can be taken out by another animal. You know that penguins do this. Um, there are several other animals that will huddle in a cold uh, winter night uh, in, in with birds. You can see them sometimes perched in wires, right there, one right there next to the other. <coughs> and the close proximity is precisely to minimize the amount of heat that is going to be lost. Nocturnal behaviors can also be another behavioral strategy. Animals that live in very hot places like the desert don't go out hunting during the day. When the sun is shining, it's too hot, but they go out at night when it's cooler. And of course, they would have to have sensory adaptations like vision to be able to see better at nighttime. Um, and so... That's going to be uh, behavioral responses. Other responses can be if it's if the sun is shining and the air is too cold, we'll go bask in the sun, take some radiation. Uh, a number of things animals can do can help also with achieving a steady state in terms of temperature. Metabolic adjustments are also interesting. Animals sometimes can increase the production or the release of heat by increasing the metabolism. And so the increase of metabolism can be done in a couple of things. Shivering. So when, when an animal is shivering, muscle contractions are using energy. The use of energy releases heat as one of the consequences of energy transformations. Muscle activity, animals are going to sometimes be active. Instead of uh, staying in one place in the winter time, you can see, especially when it's snowy outside, you may be surprised to see birds flying, looking on the snow for something to eat. And you may think like, well, there's nothing on the snow for them to eat, but just the activity itself, they're moving and searching for something is what generates internal heat so that they can maintain a warmer body. Uh, sometimes metabolism can increase without muscle contractions, without shivering, and we call this non-shivering thermogenesis. Sometimes mitochondria can increase activity because when they begin using fuel molecules uh, in order to make ATP, it's not because the ATP is needed, it's just for the sake of generating heat. Uh, one of those examples of uh, non-shivering thermogenesis will be the use of uh, what we call brown fat. And so brown fat is something that is present in babies uh, but now it has been discovered that adults also have it, especially in, along the neck region and between the shoulders is where you can see some of the brown fat. And so the appearance of the fat is kind of brownish because of a higher number of mitochondria. And so those mitochondria, when they begin using uh, the fat molecules to store in the brown fat, are going to be releasing heat and without the need for muscle contractions and without the need for shivering or any other type of movement. And so non-shivering thermogenesis would be a strategy we can count as a form of a metabolic adjustment. And uh, so that is going to be all for thermoregulation. I have one more video I want to make for you, and it's going to deal with metabolism and um, metabolic budgets for an animal.